Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. What's up? Come on. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here today. If you're joining with us online, we're glad to have you guys as well. Um, just a few housekeeping notes as we get ready to move forward. If you're cool, we are broadcasting on 107.7 here in the parking lot. Um, so if you want to tune your radio to that, it's 107.7. Um, just make sure that if you don't mind, if you're unless you're uh, one of the ones going around that we've designated as helping park people and do stuff like that, uh, please try to stay right there in your vehicle as much as possible. Uh, actually, in the vehicle, um, and I know that we want to move around and talk and all that kind of stuff. But make sure you're staying in your vehicles uh, due to the mandate, so we can keep having this service. Um, also, as well, uh, at the end of the service. Um, when you're leaving, we'll all leave out this driveway over here. Uh, all from boxes over there. It's actually all from trash can. Um, but uh, you can drop your stuff in there if you want to. For our folks at home, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're uh, worshiping along with us. And I hope everybody's staying safe and healthy. Um, and we sure ain't going to stop serving the Lord, that's for sure. Uh, so let's praise God. Are y'all guys ready to praise God this morning to sing along with us? There you go. All right. I think you know the first one. There's power in the blood. Let's sing together, guys. philippicoc.org um, and they've also put them on the church Facebook page uh, but every week those words will be posted to our songs so some of them you may some of them you may not depending on uh, what you're used to but we're trying to do a good mix here of the songs so this one here is called Stand in Your Love um, and so when our fear is uh, trying to make us step aside and, and, and do those things we can stand in His love for sure let's pray
thankful for this time that we can be here now just singing these songs of praise and lift them up to you. Father, we look forward to hearing your message brought to us this morning. We pray, Lord, for the ones who've been affected by this epidemic. We pray for the ones that are doing the caregiving for them, keeping them safe. Keep us all safe, Lord, and we pray this thing will be over soon. For all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you uh, have brought something to take communion with, if you want to go ahead and get those uh, emblems now, uh, if you have any cracker or juice or anything, we're going to be singing the song, Good, Good Father. So if you want to go ahead and get your uh, stuff ready for that, uh, we're going to sing the song, Good, Good Father, and after that, uh, we'll be offering a meditation. At the end of that meditation, we're going to um, take our communion together, uh, the loaf and the, the cup, whatever you have to take with that. Um, so we're going to get ready and sing that.
As I kind of thought about my meditation um, this week, one of these words that keep coming up, um, and you hear a lot, and you see people post a lot, and you, uh, is the word essential. Certain people um, may feel different because they've been told in their livelihoods and in what's going on, basically that they don't fall in an essential category. You know, we, we face that, you know, at our home. Some of you may as well. Um, that you're told that, hey, your, your chosen profession is not essential at this time while others are. And it can do something to you. It can do something to you mentally. It can do something to your psyche. It can do something especially to your wallet. Um, it can do all of those things. And as we kind of sit back and we think about that, it got me thinking about the, the way we do sometimes when it comes to the family of God. Do we sometimes value others more than others? Do we sometimes place a value on certain ones above others? And it got me thinking that way And it's, it, as we get ready and move into the week that's going toward Easter. You know, this week is a week that, that we as Christians hold more dear than almost any week because it looks at the way that he, right now they're hollering Hosanna, Hosanna, and, and they're leading up to that, but he's also leading to a cross as well. You know, Easter's going to be unlike any of us have, I have ever known in my lifetime this year because it's going to really show something a little different. You know, it's going to be held in a different fashion. The same way we're being held in a different fashion of church service today or all across the world, wherever you may be choosing to do. But that came up one time and Jesus really, uh, he, in the 15th chapter of Luke, you have three parables there. And it says the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. And he told those to the Pharisees. And what he did, he said, he gave three examples. And he wanted to make sure that you understood more than anything in the world that the Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what the world says, what the economy says, whatever, you are essential to him. So much that he went to the cross and he shed his blood and he, had, he bore our stripes for our sins. And that's when we come together now. Each week we remember a time that where we remember of communion and the juice represents his shed blood and the cracker represents his, his body that was broken for us. So no matter what goes on in life, no matter what goes on in, in anything coming forward, we need to remember as we move forward to Easter, as we move forward to this time now, as we clear our minds of everything else, how essential we were to God that he gave his only one son, Jesus Christ, to go to that cross for our sins. So this morning as we get ready and partake, as I said, we have the cracker, which represents his broken body. We have the, uh, the uh, juice, which represents his, blood, uh, his shed blood. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to take them together, okay? I'll tell you, let's take, let's take them together, and we'll have a word of prayer. So if you will, let's take our uh, cracker together, which represents the, the broken body at this time. And let's take the juice, which represents uh, his shed blood that was for us. Let's go to God and work prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much just now for how much you love us, Father. You tell us over and over, and especially in that chapter, Father, in the 15th chapter of Luke, you give three examples of how you had 99 sheep, but you ran after the one. You had nine coins, but you went after it, and you flipped the house upside down, and you searched for the one lost coin. Father, you did all of these things showing us that no matter... We can never be too gone not to matter to you. And ultimately, you showed us that on Friday this week. You went to a cross. You bore the place that we should have been because you said, these are my children. I love you. That I'd give my life for you. Father, help us to remember that as we go through this week, as we go through this time now, as we take communion each time. May we remember that these aren't just cracker and juice. They aren't just a time that we pause. It is a time that we fellowship with you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, for always being there for us, and for most of all, giving your Son on the cross for us, so we may have a home in heaven with you. If you don't know him today, Father, I just pray that someone would know, come to know you 
and uh, just it's not too late. We love you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. with us uh, online as well. Uh, we're going to be talking this morning about overcoming despair. You know, in, in the fact that we live in a time where, in, in our country particularly, it's a time of affluence, it's a time of freedom, it's a time of opportunity. At the same time, right now, most folks are, are worried, uh, many are depressed, some are discouraged and despondent uh, because of the, the news when there's deaths, the job losses, uh, the threat of the virus right around the corner. Um, not to mention the usual things that we see, things that uh, all of us deal with uh, every day in life, and that is the increased uh, rate of suicide, uh, drug addiction, uh, those that are, are facing uh, layoffs uh, that normally happen. There's divorce, uh, there's alcoholism, there's runaways. Um, people are just not happy uh, with their lives. And the demon of despair steals away all across the land gleefully, if you will, taking people hostage, unsuspectingly. And I think maybe today, like never before in our land, is he doing that. So almost everyone, I think, experiences discouragement at one time or another. And maybe we don't turn to drugs, maybe we don't uh, go to alcohol, we don't do those things. But yet, uh -oh. uh, but yet we're burdened uh, by uh, despair uh, because of something's going on occasionally. And I, I believe we all could use a word of, of hope. Anybody with me? Use a word of hope today? Amen. Uh, you know, the, the Israelites were in, they were in a pickle. Uh, they had escaped from Egypt, uh, and the, the, they needed a tremendous message of hope. I'm, I'm getting a... It must be a short Yeah, I know. Thank, thanks for the encouragement. Uh, I'm having a short in my... I'm trying to cordless mic here. All right. I'm going to try I'm going to pick up the handheld here. Is the handheld still on the floor? Yeah, test one, two, test one, two. All righty. I tried to go with my cordless today to see if we could make it a little bit more natural. We had a little bit of greenery out here, which is falling on the ground. For those of you at home that don't, or though the Facebook don't see that, uh, but breeze a little bit. But uh, we're trying to go with the, the, the cordless I normally preach with. And uh, maybe if I don't move so much, it won't. Uh, it'll be all right. Thank you. Uh -huh. The Israelites were at an impasse at, at the Red Sea. You might remember the, the story just hours before they had escaped from Egypt. Uh, the plagues were there and uh, they were released from slavery. But now uh, they were in the pit of despair. They're backed up against the Red Sea. And the manner in which God uh, delivered them miraculously, I think should be a source of encouragement for us during our times uh, of discouragement. Uh, such, and I'm going to... All right, we're going to try this way. Here we go. All right. Devil's trying to get the best of us, but he's not going to do it. Amen? All right. Um, perhaps we feel entrapped. Uh, the Egyptians, we look find in, in Exodus 14, 9, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. The Egyptians, uh, all Pharaoh's horses, the chariots, the horsemen, the troops, they pursued the Israelites and they overtook them as they camped by the sea. And we look up a verse ahead of that, and look how bad it was. It said, Pharaoh himself took 600 of his best chariots, along with all the others in Egypt and officers above them. It must have been an awesome sight, if you will, maybe a horrendous sight would be a better word, as he saw the, the Egyptians pouring down on them, and they had nowhere to go. They're backed up against the sea, if you will. One to two million Israelites, we believe, and they could not outrun the Egyptian army. Uh, they were helplessly trapped. I think there's many times in our lives that uh, things seem hopeless. People are trapped by damaging sinful habits. Well-meaning people get trapped in sinful habits. We can get involved in sins that maybe seem harmless at the time, at the beginning, but after a while, the, the pleasure's gone and it seems like we can't stop drinking or we can't stop doing drugs, we can't stop gambling, we can't stop 
telling the off-color jokes or, or losing our tempers or being involved in pornography. And as we find Ephesians 4.19, it says we have a continual lust for more. If individuals will say, you know, I want to stop, but I can't. I just can't. I'm consumed by it. And we're oftentimes trapped by our evil desires. Titus 3.3 3 says at one time you too were foolish. You were disobedient. You were deceived. You were enslaved by all kinds of passions and, and pleasures. Other times I think we're trapped in what we might call dead-end relationships. They, they seem like these relationships, you know, maybe it's, it's somebody that you work with. It just takes the joy out of your work. Maybe it's a neighbor that is just really impossible to live with. Maybe it's even somebody at church that you have a hard time getting along with. Or perhaps you're in a loveless marriage. You think, well, you know, I'm not attractive anymore. Or he doesn't care about me anymore. Or, you know, I just want a divorce. And we feel trapped in this. And I'm staying in it for the kids or whatever it might be. And as we think about that, these negative emotions are many times very intense. And we feel trapped. Oftentimes we're trapped in a deteriorating body. Some may feel like your body's just not functioning like it used to. You know, once you lived free of pain and you were in good health, uh, but now, maybe because of an accident or maybe because of disease or maybe just because you're, you're growing older, uh, your body just is not functioning like it used to. You, you can't see like you used to. You can't, can't hear like you used to. And, and maybe you're even confined to a wheelchair or to a walker or maybe you're on oxygen. Proverbs 5.11 comes to mind. At the end of your life, you will groan, and when your flesh and your body are spent. So it can be discouraging to be trapped in a deteriorating body. Some of us, and maybe all of us at this particular time, are trapped in difficult circumstances. Uh, maybe it's a mundaneness of life that seems like every day looks like the last, or maybe you feel trapped in a, in a dead-end job that has little chance of you moving up or advancement. Maybe it's a complicated uh, family situation that you're in that, that just rips your heart out because it seems like there's no answers to what's going on within your family. Or maybe this virus, which has literally trapped many people in their homes, trapped us with bills and some with no jobs, trapped us with no definite end in sight, and perhaps no real cure on the horizon. When they have these series of difficulties, and it, it means complicated and we feel trapped, it may seem hopeless to us. Let's look what happened next with the, the Israelites. Not only were they entrapped, they were embittered. We find in verse 10 of chapter 14, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified, and they cried out to the Lord. So, first of all, they complained uh, against God. Now, I mean, this wasn't really a prayer for help, you know. That would have been a, a proper response, if you will. But this was a prayer of exasperation. This was a prayer of complaint, if you will. They were saying, my God, why, why have you left us like this? Where are you at? What have you done to us? And oftentimes, if we want to be real, that's our response. Lord, why did you let this virus come? I mean, why am I losing my job? Why are things like this? I, I don't understand. The psalmist kind of said the same thing. David, in Psalm 13 Maybe you can identify with his, his words. I certainly can. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look at one of the next things they did. They criticized their leader. Verse 14, 11. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here in this desert to die? I mean, these were mean words, means of sar mean words of sarcasm, if you will, uh, uh, against Moses. And isn't it typical of human nature to lash out at your leaders when you feel trapped? When you feel pressure, uh, we begin to complain. Oh, what's the president done to, to get rid of this virus? And the media is really giving him a pass, aren't they? <laughs> right. Uh, what What are our leaders doing? To why were we more prepared? We say, well, you know, why don't the elders do more to help out our youth? Or why don't the coach make them hustle a little better? We'd win some games. Or why did the boss, why didn't he see what all that I'm doing behind the scenes? Or why doesn't that preacher preach something useful for a change? Or uh, why does my husband, why don't he understand uh, how I feel? And like the frustrated Israelites, oftentimes the, we're very skillful at complaining. Give me a honk if you say Amen. <laughs> Anybody complain this week? I'm sure you have. 
Third thing they did was they distorted their past. Look at chapter 14, verse 12. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Man, these emotionally insecure people must have developed amnesia. How quickly they forgot that they were slaves. And for 400 years, they had complained and they had cried out to God, Release us. Help us to get out of here, God. And now, what are they doing? Let us go back to Egypt. We didn't have it so bad. Do you notice how quickly we distort our past when we get bitter? You know, someone involved in an extramarital affair may say, Well, I was married for 20 years and I never was happy. Well, that probably wasn't true. There's a great deal of happiness, but you forgot it. Others will say, Well, back when I was growing up, we didn't have much, but we never complained. Truth is, they griped all the time, you know. People who grew up in the church back during the days when the churches were filled, and, and we say, I remember the churches, they were so full of people. We had services that went on for hours. We had revivals that went on for weeks. Well, there's some truth to that, but that was the day when there was not as many churches, and there were circuit preachers. Oftentimes, they were preaching once or twice a month. The church was a social center, and because, actually, there wasn't a lot more to do. And oftentimes, you know, even with parents, they get exasperated their children. They say, well, I don't understand why you can't get along. My brother and sister, we were really close. We never fought like you guys. And then your parents hear you say that, and they start giggling. And they say, well, you got a terrible memory. You children, you fought all the time. You just don't remember it. Franklin Roosevelt said, nothing is so responsible for the good old days as a bad memory. And perhaps that's true. Let's third look at their escape as we move on today. God intervened. In the Israelites' troubling situation, and he found them a way to escape. Look what happens in verses 13 and 14. Note, we'll notice three things there. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians that you see today, you're going to never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need to only be still. When we face impossible situations... We need to stand firm, brothers and sisters. You believe that? Amen? Stand firm. I think a tendency of most people, and we see it all across the nation today, is to panic. You know, let's look for some way we can cleverly outmaneuver this or do something that, that's going to help us in some way. And there's nothing wrong with taking care of your family. But many people resort to, to lies and to cheating and manipulation and other people are going into drugs and to stealing. We see that. Or, or even suicide that's taking place. Um, and we get ourselves in deeper trouble than we were to begin with. The instructions that Moses gave was stand firm in the Lord. Don't panic. The Lord's going to fight this battle for you if you'll stand firm. Now let's look what happened in, in verses 19 and 20. The angel of God who had been traveling in front of the Israelite army withdrew and he went behind them the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and it stood behind them coming between them and the armies of egypt and israel throughout the night the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side so neither went near the other all night long the story is told of felix anola he was fleeing from the enemy he crawled into a, a small opening in the cave and he hid and he instinctively Pray to God for safety. A spider began spinning a web over the small entrance to the cave. The enemy troops came right up to the mouth of the cave. They saw the spider's web, and they concluded, well, nobody could be inside of that, and they left. Nola later said these words, Where God is, a web is like a wall, and where God is not, a wall is like a web. On that night, by the Red Sea, God spun an impenetrable wall between Egypt and between the Israelites. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, when we face despair, which many of us right now, it takes trusting on God. And when we depend on God, we wait for God to act. He will spin that web for us. There's sometimes we've got to realize there's nothing that we can do to correct the situation. But I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to do something stupid. I'm not going to do something dishonest. I'm going to wait. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to be courageous. We need to hear Psalm 46.10. I know I do, and we need to live it. It says, be still and know that I am God. I need that advice. I think you do too. 
There's nothing that you and I can do ultimately about the coronavirus. I don't think any of us are working on cures for it. But I shouldn't be worryful. I shouldn't be fretful. I shouldn't be fearful. I need to wait on the Lord. Not panic. I need to trust in Him. Viktor Frankl was taken prisoner by the Nazis during World War II. And because he was a Jew, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he tells that his wife, his children, his parents were all killed in the Holocaust. And one day the Gestapo made him stand up in front of them. They stripped him of his clothes. They jeered at him. They, they tore off his wedding band. And he responded this way. You can take my wife. You can take my children. You can strip me of my clothes and my freedom. But there's one thing that no one can take away from me. And that is the freedom that I have to choose how I will react to the things that happen to me. Now that's courage. And that's what it takes for us right now. We need that courage to stand firm. And we choose not to panic. We, we choose to trust and not to be fearful in this. So when your teenage daughter becomes pregnant out of wedlock, don't encourage abortion. Trust God. When the child is using drugs, don't pretend it's no big deal. You know, deal with it. Discipline and love and get help. But trust God. When your marital relationship is, is on the rocks, don't be quick to throw in the towel. Seek Christian counseling and, and trust God. And when all of, of us, all of us are fighting this coronavirus, don't panic, don't worry, don't fret. Trust God. Stand firm with Him in this desperate situation. The second thing we need to do is what they did. When the, when the way opens up, we need to move forward. Then the Lord said to Moses, verse 15 through 16, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites will go through the sea on dry ground. We pick up verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night the Lord drove back with a strong east wind and turned it to dry land. The waters were divided. The Israelites went through the sea on dry ground and with a wall of water on the right and on the left. Now that had to be a... An awesome experience, but a terrifying one at the same time. Can you imagine that? The walls of water on, on one side and on the other as you walk through. I remember that a long time ago, seeing that movie, The Ten Commandments, when it first came out with Yule Brenner. And they see that water. Boy, that was an awesome thing. Heard the story, my favorite story. You've probably heard it before about the little boy that came back from Sunday school. And he had been taught this lesson in Sunday school. And his dad asked him what he'd learned because he didn't know. And the little boy said, well, I learned about the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. And the dad wanted to see how much he really learned. So he said, well, how'd it go? He said, well, Moses and the Israelites, they were trapped at the Red Sea. The Egyptian armies, they're coming after them, and they couldn't get out. So Moses, he had his engineers build a pontoon boat, and so they could go across the Red Sea, and they all marched across to the other side. They looked, they saw the Egyptians were coming after them, so Moses got on his radio. He called in for an airstrike, and the Israeli Air Force bombed out the bridge, and all the Egyptians drowned. Now his father said, son, is that really the way the teacher told the story? He said, well, dad, no, not exactly. But if I told you the story the way she told it, you wouldn't believe it. I think today, many people, we see skeptics say, oh, that couldn't happen. They just walked through some, a dry place in there. Or there was an earthquake. But I tell you, there was a simple explanation to what happened there. God performed a miracle. That's what happened. God was in charge. Now, we don't know how he did it, but he did a mighty, powerful miracle because nothing is impossible to God. Amen? I think for us, we need to realize that uh, God performs miracles today as well. And as he gives us opportunities, as he did the Israelites, oftentimes that opportunity opens up. We're frightened. We hesitate. But in reality, I think maybe we need a challenge a new challenge that gets the adrenaline flowing. A new challenge that gets the creative juices flowing, if you will. A challenge that gets our minds off the limitations and off our troubles and onto the future. So I want to challenge you, particularly during this virus time, to reach out uh, to others around you. To let, you, let them know that, that you care. Uh, to do something, if you can, for friends and find out what needs may be there. You know, we see that happening, I think, more and more. And there's good stories that are, are being told about people that are, are doing things for folks they don't even know and, and, and wonderful things happening. Let's be on the front lines with that. 
You know, and moving forward sometimes seems dangerous. It's hard for us to get out of our comfort zone. But other times, we don't want to risk being alone, so we stay in a, a sinful relationship that we know that that's outside of God's will. We don't want to risk insecurity, so we stay in a job that is stifling. We don't want to risk being a, becoming a member of the church because maybe we don't want to cut off our past with our past church or we think the church has some type of hidden agenda. Or We don't want to risk making a commitment to God for the first time to become a Christian because everybody we've, we've had a commitment with has broken those commitments and we wonder whether God is going to really follow through and be committed to us. Or maybe we don't want to, to leave a sinful habit. Uh, because we're afraid and we just don't know if we can break it. And we rationalize what other people are doing it. So we don't move forward and we, we don't grow spiritually. Someone said a lot of people no longer hope for the best. They just, uh, they just hope to avoid the worst. Now let's look what happens when the way opens up. We trust God. We move forward. Verse 22. The Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. That must have taken probably a, a full day for a million or more, maybe two million people to cross through the Red Sea. And what an awesome experience. The Bible says that during that last watch of the night that the Lord threw the Egyptian army into confusion. We don't know if the wheels fell off. We don't know if the horses went crazy, but they did. And the, is, is, the Egyptians, they panicked. We pick up there in verse 25. They say, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them and against Egypt. Then that's when the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and the chariots and the horsemen. And Moses obeyed. And we know what the rest of the story is. The sea flowed back over them. They drowned the entire army of Pharaoh. They followed them and not one of them survived. God can do more than we ever imagined. Scripture tells us that. Amen. Ephesians 3.20. God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Do you believe that today? Amen. Let's take, that's something you can take to the bank. The Bible says that we trust his will, we move forward, and he'll bless. And at the very end, when the victory is realized, we need to give him the thanks. Look at Exodus 14, 31. The Israelites saw the great power of the Lord against the Egyptians. The people feared the Lord. They put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. In Exodus 15, we get to see the song that, that Moses sang and the Israelites sang. And it says, I will sing to the Lord. For he is highly exalted, the horse and the rider he's hurled into the sea. This suggests the third reaction to despair. The last one I'll talk about today is that when victory is realized, God needs to get the credit. And, and sometimes there's a tendency for us to, to take the credit ourselves. I mean, we can go from pure panic to egotism in just a minute. It's like the guy who's falling off the cliff and he's pleading, Lord, Lord, Lord save me, Lord, save me. And suddenly he, he hangs on a snag and he says, that's okay, Lord, I got it now. He forgets God so quick. And we say things like, well, I worked hard, put myself through school, or I saved myself a lot of money, I invested wisely, or I tried to discipline my kids, and I set a good example, or I followed the doctor's orders, and I exercised, that's why I lived this long. Or, well, we've been, we've been married for 50 years, but it's because we worked harder. You know, we got through those tough days of the coronavirus because we, we isolated ourselves, and we got prepared. When the victory is realized, and this is a, a bygone thing, where we're meeting back in the buildings and we're doing life as back to normal, we better give God the thanks and the praise. Amen? Amen. Okay. Our prayers are answered and maybe your, your finances prosper, your children are doing well, or health is good, your relationship is mended, and the church has experienced growth and our jobs come back. Let's make sure we're giving God the thanks because that's what God did. Psalm 43, 5 says, Why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. God doesn't promise that He's going to exempt us from trials in this life. We know not. We talked about that last week. He does promise that He will deliver us through them. And when He does, we need to praise His name. I believe that God opened the sea for the Israelites to, to walk through on, on dry ground, on a path that would lead them to the promised land. But we need to remember what happened next. All would die without ever seeing it, except for two people, Joshua and Caleb. You see, Satan's ultimate entrapment is death. The Bible calls it the last enemy to be defeated. Every one of us is going to come to the point in our life 
uh, where we have no one else to go. And unless Jesus Christ returns first, you know, we're going to that point, we're going to only be able to trust God and wait. But he reminds us to don't fear that he's going to be with us. His rod and his staff, they're going to comfort us, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And at the point in time, he's going to part the waters for us, and we're going to be able to walk through on dry ground. As I think about that, then we'll be able to say with Paul, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory, how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's because of that today, he goes on to say, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor for the Lord is not in vain. We're going to sing a closing song this morning. And in that closing song, uh, you have a chance to respond, whether you're at home, um, if you've got uh, questions that you'd like to call us and, and talk with us about, you feel free to do that or write an email, and uh, we'll be glad to try to, to help you out uh, today. If you've got a decision to make to become a uh, Christian, I uh, pray that you can come forward and do that right now. If you want to wait around and then come back here to the back, we can talk about what you need to do in your life to believe, repent, confess, uh, to be baptized, and to walk in newness of life. Or maybe that's a new commitment today that you need to make uh, to say, Lord, I, I want to trust you more. I want to make sure that I'm giving you the best in my life. And maybe there's some sinful habit that we need to be breaking. And, and you just say, God, I, I trust you to help me to do that. Because I know that you will. And you don't want me to live in that way. I need to move forward. I need to stand firm in your word. Because when all said and done, oh, each one of us are going to bow before him. And we need to make sure we're ready. We're going to sing uh, three verses of When We Walk With The Lord, Trust and Obey is our closing. that you've been with us in the past and that you'll be with us in the future. Help us, Father, when we're weak. Help us, Father, when we're fearful, when we're anxious. Help us to pray and ask for your strength and your courage and to trust you. We thank you and we love you. And we, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to show others that love that you've shown us each and every day as we reach out to others and get our mind off our troubles by reaching out and touching other people's lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, for, for those that are here with us, we do have the, the offering box or can that's back over there. And those that are over there by it are just in case you happen to drop your offering. They're not to take it from you because we don't want you coming in contact. So just drop it by the, the offering basket uh, as you go through. And, and we're glad that you're doing that and uh, helping our services. Uh, for those online, we will be having our service next Sunday at 10 at the same time. It is a little different than what we do in the Easter Sunday. We will not be having a sunrise, a service, but we have one service at 10 o'clock. So we hope that you're here next week and invite others.
Uh, God bless. Have a good day. Hork if you love. Love the Lord. Amen. God bless.